Vermont PBS, in cooperation with Orca Media and the Vermont Press Bureau, presents Capital Beat, the week in review from the Vermont State House. Here's host Neil Goswami. Welcome everyone to Capital Beat. Thanks for joining us. I'm Neil Goswami with the Vermont Press Bureau. It is tax season, and as you at home get ready to prepare your income tax uh, forms, we are here to talk with Janet Ansel, representative from Callis and the chairwoman of the uh, House Ways and Means Committee, and Representative Sam Young, the vice chairman of the committee, all about taxes. Great. Thank yeah. you both for joining us. Thank you. Uh, it was this week that you had a, what I think was an interesting conversation in your committee about uh, the sales tax and the impact of online sales on the sales tax. Um, Amazon began collecting the state's 6% sales tax this month, and uh, you got some facts and figures about what Amazon will likely collect and remit back to the state and uh, what other retailers online will, uh, will be doing. So before we get into those specific numbers, I just I wanna talk a little bit about the challenges you've faced with online retail and what the state has done to address it. It's, this has been a problem that our committee has been struggling with for actually years now. Um, it's clear that, um, in fact, the trend lines are kind of astonishing. The number of sales that have moved to remote, what we call rem remote sellers, right. whether it's catalog or online. Um, sellers who don't have what's called physical presence mm -hmm. in the state are not under the Constitution required to collect taxes on our behalf. And um, as more and more sales go to these remote sellers, our sales tax base is eroding. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been working for years to try to get our arms around that problem and find a way to uh, collect the money. And um, one of the early efforts um, had to do with the Streamlined Sales Tax Project, right. which Sam is our representative on, uh, representing Vermont. Um, and that, was, that worked um, to an extent. Um, there were also efforts in Congress to try to um, uh, give states the, you know, permission to require uh, sellers to collect the tax. Those faltered. Mm -hmm. um, and so more recently, um, we adopted last year um, a provision that required remote sellers to notify uh, people who buy stuff through them mm -hmm. how much they bought so right. that they would know how much they have to report in use tax. And, um, I don't know if it was that or a number of other things, but one of the, of the breakthroughs for us was that Amazon agreed to collect voluntarily on mm -hmm. our behalf starting in February. Do we know at all, uh, for either of you, why Amazon voluntarily decided to collect? Well, you know, we have some guesses why. I think their business model may have evolved. They have physical presence in more and more states as time goes on. Um, it, the, they may also be looking at a legal challenge that's coming out of South Dakota, mm -hmm. um, which looks like it might have some chance of success. Um, these notice provisions may be a piece of it. I haven't talked to them directly since we did the affiliate nexus bill a few years ago. Um, so we'd be guessing, um, but we do know that they agreed to collect for other states that where they don't have physical presence. And for people watching, physical presence means a store right. or a warehouse or, or a business office right. in the state. Okay. Uh, Representative Young, as our resident expert on the uh, streamlined sales and use tax yeah. agreement, yeah. Uh, I know it's somewhat convoluted. I actually looked at the agreement <laughs> last night and it was about 250 pages long. So I gave up on it. Uh, I'm hoping you can give me a brief summary of what it does and, and, and how it uh, helps the states in terms of uh, tax collection. There's 23 streamlined sales tax states. Um, and I think it's particularly good for small, small states mm -hmm. in terms of you know, having uniformity in the way in which we collect sales tax. Essentially, there's um, different categories of products that you, know, you can either choose to tax or not tax, but mm -hmm. the, the idea is to keep the definitions the same from state to state. Okay. Um, and this is actually something that the organization, um, which is interestingly, it, it's the, a lot of the leadership and a lot of the states are really kind of Republican states, um, and, uh, but we lobby Congress on the, uh, 
the kind of the Marketplace Fairness Act or mm -hmm. trying to get remote sellers to remit sales tax to the, the, the state that the product was ordered in, right. essentially. Okay. Um, and to try and create that parity with, you know, kind of your downtown businesses so that yeah. they can actually compete with the, the stores online. Yeah. So the, the parity is a big th yeah. thing that we'd hear about in terms of online sales or mm -hmm. remote sales and then the brick and mortar shops that we have here in Vermont. Um, and it's really, a, what I've heard is that it's a, a problem that only Congress can solve essentially by, uh, by requiring one state or all states mm -hmm. to, to, to participate in the sales tax agreements. Um, is that true? Is there anything else Vermont can do to force companies to, to collect and remit? Well, these two things that I talked about um, are initiatives in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, when I talk about the notice requirement, this yeah. is a law that Colorado passed two or three years ago, and it requires the remote seller to notify right. every purchaser in the state um, of what they purchased. Um, and I'll talk in a second about what they're required to do with that. Right. Um, but the um, so that's one avenue that I think is, is actually bearing fruit, and that was um, upheld by a federal district court. U.S. Supreme Court was asked to hear it, um, I think, in December, and they said they didn't want to hear it, which left the the, uh, lower, court. the, the lower court decision standing. So that actually is sort of is good law. Um, yeah. The other avenue, though, is that the the U.S. Supreme Court case that says you have to have physical presence in the state is a case called Quill. Um, and there is um, strong indication that if a challenge to that or, or revisiting that decision went to the U.S. Supreme Court, that they would decide it differently. Uh -huh. And they would, just, they would say that you don't have to have physical presence in the state. You just have to sell into the state. And um, if that were to happen, that's the effort that's going on out of South Dakota. Right. If that were to happen. That would be the game changer. That's the game changer. And we did pass legislation last year that said as soon as Quill gets overturned, mm -hmm. we're, we will uh, collect. And, uh, you know, the, to be clear, the, the, uh, there are really sort of three reasons why it matters. One is our eroding tax base, and, you know, we need revenue to do right. the things that we've committed to do. The other is what Sam talked about is the competition between our bricks and mortar stores, mm -hmm. and bookstores, I think, are particularly sensitive right. to that. Mm -hmm. um, but the third is sort of a tax fairness thing that um, some people are paying um, the use tax, which I'll talk about if uh, I think it makes sense to explain yeah. it, and a lot of people are not. Um, and so you really don't have equity among taxpayers in terms of, of paying what they right. owe. And um, you, you really want to have a tax system that has fairness built into it. Right. Um, so the use tax really quickly, sure. it, um, when you buy something out of state, right. whether you buy it online or catalog or you drive to New Hampshire to buy it, um, and it would be taxable in Vermont if you bought it in Vermont. You buy it somewhere else, you bring it back to Vermont to use it, um, you then owe the 6% tax on it. Right. And that's a tax called the use tax um, that only 10% of filers actually pay. Um, maybe 90% or mm -hmm. so should. Um, and your committee heard problem. testimony from the tax commissioner yep. this week that if all Vermonters paid annually on their income tax form yeah. um, what they were supposed to pay, the state would take in about $28 million. I think that's about right. And right now you're only seeing collection of about $3 million. Exactly. Um, so That's there's right. a lot of tax cheats out there. Is that is that well, the, the story I, here? I, I think a lot of people don't know they're supposed to pay it. Yeah. Um, it's it's actually um, it, when you say to somebody, you know, do you pay your use tax? It's probably not the way, kind of conversation most of us have. But yeah. I do occasionally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> most people have. Yeah. <laughs> it's because you guys people, are kind of tax, tax geeks. geeks. Yeah. Um, most people have no idea what you're talking about. So yeah. they're not deliberately not paying it. People will say, you know, well, I bought it in New Hampshire, so I don't have to pay the tax. Right. People say that to me, and I'm thinking, actually, you really do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they're so just not aware of it. I think a lot of people are not aware of it. Um, and so I, I don't know that I would say that they're tax cheats. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's too strong a <laughs> word. Um, but they could be better volunteer payers okay. than they are. Okay. Uh, other testimony that you heard was from the Joint Fiscal Office. Yeah. Um, and they estimated through public 
records, basically, information that is publicly available, mm -hmm. that Amazon may be collecting and remitting as much as $8 million a year, which uh, is a lot of money, but maybe not mm -hmm. as much as some people may have thought uh, would be coming into the state. Was When you heard those figures, what, did that uh, sound right to you? Did it sound like we should be getting more? Well, I, I mean, I thought it, it, maybe it was a little lower than I might have expected, but mm -hmm. uh, we need to remember that we don't have a tax on clothing. Right. Um, we don't have a tax on non-prescription drugs. Well, under a hundred dollars, right? No, no, any clothing is, is it, ex no, all okay. clothing is exempt. It's actually in order yeah. to join streamlines. You had to get tax, rid of that. We had to we, get rid of the threshold, yeah, which okay. is what those definitions do to us. Right. Um, okay. So well, I like that then. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so if if you buy clothing or, or non-prescription drugs right. through Amazon, you don't pay the tax. The other thing is that you don't pay it if the um, the book, if that's what you bought, mm -hmm. comes through a third-party seller. So Amazon might connect you with a bookstore in uh, Nebraska right. somewhere, um, and they're the ones who send you the book, and they're not collecting the tax on so that. So even though they're using the Amazon platform, exactly. Amazon won't collect the tax. That's that's only on their products is I what see. they're yeah. actually on what they taxes on. What's it. coming from that. essentially their warehouses? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. So we still have a problem. Yeah. And that may actually, if you think about it, be part of the uh, catalog sales figure. It's hard to know. So you heard that, that um, 6.3 or 4 million seven, in other seven, online retailers, yeah. right? And then yes. yes. 7.4 million yes. in uh, mail order, yeah. which was a so bit mind boggling uh, right. to everyone this week yeah, that there's still that much uh, commerce going on I through know. catalog orders and mail orders. Yeah. Very uh, surprising to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, overall, yeah. Yeah. you know, we're looking at if you subtract out the $8 million that the state will get from Amazon yep. now, we're, it's over $13 million yes. in potential sales tax revenue that the state is not collecting. That's right. Um, right. Anything your committee can do at all uh, to address that at this point? Well, we hope that this notice provision that we, I keep going back to this, mm -hmm. but we passed this law last yeah. year, takes effect July 1st, um, and it will require other online sellers, other sellers other than Amazon, um, and catalog sellers, I think, mm -hmm. um, to notify uh, purchasers of and, what they've purchased. And the tax department? No. No? Okay. No. We took that. We took that out. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's just the purchaser. Okay. When the consumer gets this notice, um, will it direct them on how to fill out their tax form at the you know end of the year, um, and and explain the table and how much they have to pay on it? We're not asking the seller to tell tell them about our tax law, okay. just how much they purchased. But then it's our job to make sure that they know what they should be doing with that information. Okay. Any other retailers besides Amazon indicating to you or the tax department or anyone in Vermont that they plan to follow Amazon's lead? Not that I'm aware of. And they're really, I mean, they're just such a huge player. I mean, mm -hmm. you looked at all of the kind of the other companies on the list. Yeah. And I mean, Walmart's online sales pales in comparison, but right. they're but they all, have the but they're, they are already have a physical presence. Yeah. So they are, if you order something from Walmart, have it shipped to your house, they are collecting the sales right. tax. So right. those are the really the, the yeah. two big ones. And a, and a number of the other ones also have a store in the state which would require them to yeah. collect the sales tax. And some sellers, um, because we were part of Streamline, had already agreed to do that. Apple is one mm -hmm. that just, they decided that they would collect on behalf of Streamline states, yeah. um, no matter what. So, okay. we, th so there, there's, it's a patchwork. Yeah. Um, really, and but it is, I mean, this is an issue I've been working on for years, um, and it, because my philosophy around taxes is the first thing you want to do is collect what's already owed mm -hmm. um, before you look at, at adding right. new taxes or raising right. taxes, and so to the extent we can collect what's owed, um, that that's good for everybody. Yeah, uh, Congressman Peter Welsh, uh, Vermont's lone congressman has long touted the Main Street Fairness Act, which yep. looks to address this issue. Um, any update on on where that might stand at this point? What's interesting, I, it, it has faltered. It's been right at the point of uh -huh. passing uh, several years and it just hasn't made it across the finish line. Um, in some ways, this push to overturn the Quill decision may push Congress to do something mm -hmm. because what the big uh, retailers want is they want uniform rules right. and they want um, the market 
Workplace Fairness Act actually exempts a lot of yeah. so-called small business, which is like 500,000 in sales, mm -hmm. which we think is pretty big. Um, so they would be better off if Congress had. Yeah, well, I guess states would be better off if they don't. Similar to with our GMO labeling law, we saw Congress yeah. take action yeah. once they realized yeah. that. So there may um, be a change. Yeah, I don't and know. the the kind of the report that I got at this year's Streamline Convention was that there's I mean there's a couple major players in the U.S. House that have different ways that they want to do it. It's like the chairs of two different committees that uh -huh. kind of fight over which way they want yeah. to do it. One of them wants it to be uh, you know destination based, which is what streamline really wants mm -hmm. and other people want it to be source based so you would you know it the sales tax would, it just really doesn't work and I, I think one of the things about you know the the quill decision is it goes back bef I mean this is about mail order and it's well before you know internet sales right. even exist and we you know we have software now that can tracks, calculate yeah down to you know which part of town you're in and apply the local options tax right. now and that did not exist which amazon the, does i believe yes they, yeah. that's how i understand if you order in burlington or wherever yeah. They, yeah. they will charge the local option yeah. tax yeah, okay um, the committee also discussed the blue ribbon tax commission we did report yep. this week. Uh, that's something we've heard about for a number of years. Yep. It's been sitting on a shelf, I think, collecting dust for a while. I take it out all the time. <laughs> Maybe you guys do, but nobody else does. Yeah, if you need a good it. nap, there's <laughs> nothing like it. So this study was conducted 2011, yeah. I believe. 2011. 2011. Yeah. Uh, report came out. It recommended a number of things. One of the recommendations was to consider taxing services along yeah. with uh, goods. Yeah. Um, and by expanding the sales tax, you could lower the, the base rate. Um, has that been a recent discussion in, in the committee? We did talk about it this morning. Uh, their recommendation is to expand the sales tax to services, but exempt so-called business-to-business services and um, uh, I think food and, and non-prescription and prescription drugs uh, mm -hmm. continue to be exempt. What that meant is, you, is we could, if we did, if we did all that big if, right. um, you could reduce the rate from six percent to four and a half. Yeah. And a lot of us at the time that the report came out thought, you know, maybe that's worth doing if you could get down to two percent mm -hmm. or three percent. But four and a half wasn't enough um, to make it worth it. Personally, I don't think we're going to go wholesale into applying the sales tax to services. Mm -hmm. There might be a service here and there where it does make sense to do it. You can make the compelling argument. Um, but I, I just don't see us um, moving in that direction in the way that the report recommended. I think, I think, I think not, not likely. I think the compliance on it would be just completely hard to enforce. Yeah. I mean, it would just it's hard enough. We're having issues with online sales and other things now. You right. expand it to services and um, you know the guy who might come and mow your lawn and get paid in cash and it yeah. probably opens up a whole enforcement. There, there are states that issue. do it. Yeah. Um, there are states that um, only have a sales tax, no income tax for right. example, and they tax everything. Yeah. Uh, South Dakota is one of them and I, I forget if it's Oregon or Washington is another one. So states do mm -hmm. it and I guess they deal with the compliance issues. I just don't see us making that kind of change. Yeah. Uh, just to, to shift the discussion a bit here. Um, Governor Phil Scott has put out his budget, and he has uh, his says his plan is balanced without raising taxes or fees, and he's called on lawmakers to pass a budget that does not raise any taxes or fees. Um, as the tax and fee writing committee, uh, I'd like to get your take on whether that is really feasible um, as you look at the challenges with the budget this year. Well, his budget only balances if you um, if if you buy into the proposal that he made around the education fund, right. and even then, I would question whether it balances because I think those proposals raise property taxes. Mm -hmm. Well, they balance, but it's not without new revenue. Yeah. Um, the new revenue is on the property tax side, so um, you know we're we're in a tough position in the committee, really, because we. Um, we sort of we're sort of reactive, right. you know. We you wait for the appropriations. The, yeah, bill. we wait for the governor to make a proposal and for the appropriations committee to do its work. And mm -hmm. we know we have a, a role in uh, getting to the balanced budget at the end of the session, which right. is where we'll get. Um, but I'm not sure that we know exactly what that's going to look yeah. like. But I, 
I think it's important to note that this uh, Governor Scott won the election and he won fairly comfortably and this was part of his uh, platform yeah. and so we're uh, we're aware you know very aware of it right. in the committee and in the legislature generally right um, but I don't but the ed fund um, uh, proposals the way uh, the way the ballot, ba the budget proposal was constructed mm -hmm. around changes in the education fund, I think, are hugely problematic, and yeah. they would definitely raise property taxes. Well, they shift general fund obligations to the education fund, um, and there's some debate over whether it's all covered. Yeah. Um, right. Well, and it would increase property, property taxes. taxes. It would yeah. be more than would have been if the you know. Basically, you take out all of the growth in the school budgets, mm -hmm. but then you take that money and spend right. it on something else. Yeah. And we're, we're sort of already beyond that point where we know school boards aren't going to be able to level fund at this point. Um, so the, We've already the, passed our budget. Right, right, the savings mm -hmm. uh, that he's counting on. And by they're not there. That's they're not certainly there. not there for 18. Yeah. And, you know, I... Um, I hear from people on taxes all the time. I've never heard anybody ask me to increase their property taxes. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, um, do you, does the committee have some ideas on the table for revenue if you're called upon by the Appropriations Committee to, uh, to find some, some money? You know, there, there are uh, um, uh, ideas that have been out there in previous years, and if we were looking at revenue, I suppose we would look at those kinds of proposals that are out there. But something I think is important um, to underscore, that right now we're looking at a very uncertain world relative to the money that we get from Washington. Mm -hmm. And I feel strongly that if we have tax capacity, um, and maybe we have a little here and there, but not a lot, um, but if we have it, we need to save it for, um, for when we get um, when we find out that we're not getting as much revenue and or as much money in various ways from Washington and um, I think you know we don't have the reserves that we really should have mm -hmm. in the state so if we have capacity that's really functioning more like our reserves yeah um, so, I, so I would be very reluctant to raise revenue just to solve the budget okay uh, one of the other seem to be outstanding questions right now is the governor said no fee increases but the legislature typically deals with fees on a three-year cycle so every year it's a different section of state government and I'm not sure what's up for consideration this year but uh, typically you know there are some things that need to be raised to keep up with inflation right. and otherwise have you been able to get a understanding from the administration as to whether they uh, will consider the typical schedule? I mean, we, we've looked at, we, we had them in to talk about the fee report. I mean, they're not particularly looking for um, any fee increases. Um, there's some that need to be statutorily reviewed every year. Right. Um, and so there's gonna be a bill, um, and the judici judiciary came forward with some fee changes that they would like to really just to put in practice stuff that they're already doing right. but they really need to put it in in statute um, and uh, but that doesn't particularly raise any money I mean there is a bill it just doesn't really have very much money attached right. to it um, right. one of the interesting ones in the the fee report was that they booked a bunch of money for a small farm fee but then they haven't really advocated for it, so we're yeah. still trying to figure that I'm one out. I'm sure if it's... But it was really, it, it's been, you know, there wasn't really a fee bill that they put forward, but there's a bunch of things scattered throughout the building, and it's been my yeah. job to kind of go around Corral and collect them, them right co <laughs> collect them and yeah. put them back together in one place. So. Okay. It, it, as, as it turns out, this would have been a, a light fee year. You know, yeah. every third year we have a, yeah, a, a, a fee bill that's smaller. Transportation than, and... DMV must be a big year, yeah. big one. That exactly, a and R is a big year, so and yeah. th this was designed to be a light year anyway. Okay. Um, but it's particularly light, and um, Sam is taking the lead on mm -hmm. on sort of figuring out what needs to be done and yeah. making sure it happens. Have a bigger new year next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we go, I've got a couple minutes left, Representative Young. I'd like to ask you about a marijuana legalization bill that you've. Uh, prepared for introduction. I understand yeah. it's not quite introduced yet. Uh, but it harkens back to last year and the regulated market idea that came from the Senate um, and didn't make it through the House. So uh, can you provide a, a brief update on, on what you're seeking? 
it's similar um, to what the, the Senate had proposed last year, although what it does is actually um, has a lot more small uh, grow, growers. And mm -hmm. it's, the idea is also that it's actually regulated in the Agency of Agriculture. Um, they're the ones who have the facilities to test for pesticides and right. microbes and stuff like that. Um, you know, there's, as you know, there's another proposal that would just uh, legalize um, uh, grow, you know, growing a couple plants right. at, at home. The Washington D.C. model. I, th I think the landscape has changed with Massachusetts and Maine legalizing and, and mm -hmm. kind of coming online. And I, th um, you know, I don't particularly look at this as a, as a big revenue source, but I think it is um, valuable to make you know the, it, it it safer, mm -hmm. and um, people are going to be purchasing it out of state. And so I think if it's going to be um, if it's going to be happening, that yeah. we should at least um, have some revenue. So, I mean, to pay for some prevention, education, and treatment. I don't right. particularly see that it does much more than that, but I think it, it you know, provides a, a safer product in the marketplace. And there is a, a wholesale tax of 10%? The way, the way I had it structured, actually, is a, is a retail tax of 10% okay. and a wholesale tax of 15% when okay. it's transferred to the retailer, and that you would have um, the, the commissioner uh, suggest a, a, a tax change on that wholesale tax yearly to try and regulate the price mm -hmm. so that you, the price doesn't drop too much, but also that you can um, try and undercut Discourage the black market, the which, market. which right. it is, um, yeah. you know, part of the point. Okay. Very good. Well, we're out of time, and that's probably all the tax talk Thank you. viewers at home can handle. So, Representative <laughs> I think it's so exciting. Ansel. Yes, I know. Representative <laughs> Sam Young, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Steve. And thank you for tuning thank in. You. On behalf of Orca Media and Vermont PBS, we thank you for watching, and we'll be back next week.